Podcast One presents the Steve Austin Show Classics. I'm sitting here in uh, the Broken Skull Ranch talking to Leon White, also known around the world as Big Van Vader, coming to me from, where are you at, Leon? You in Boulder, Colorado today? Boulder, Colorado, buddy. God dang, man. We've been talking about uh, getting together on a podcast and shooting the breeze. And you reached out to me through an email, and it was so good to hear from you because I'd been wanting to get you on the show and just really basically wondering in general how you were doing because I hadn't heard from you in so many years. Uh, how are you feeling right now? Steve, I'm feeling good. I mean, I'm I'm probably in better shape than I've been in the last 20 years physically, mentally. Things are going well. You know, I'm in the gym every day, and I'm uh, I'm on the road a little bit here, so things are going good and. and you know, talking about knowing you, how long do we go back? We we met what in the man early nineties in, in WCW, and I don't even remember the first time we met. Do you? No, I know, buddy. Tell me. Tell me <laughs> no, I, I, no, I don't know. I don't remember. I just remember we, we hit it off, and man, you had a hell of a run uh, in WCW as the lead heel. But we're just uh, shooting a breeze on a family friendly show. There's going to be an S bomb here and there drop, but uh, we're not going to drop any F bombs while we're talking on this hour. Man, I want to go back to your beginnings because, you know, hell, I'd forgot, you know, you've been from Boulder, Colorado for so long or living out in that area. You know, I just assumed that that's where you're from. But I, little did I know that you were born in L.A. I was born in Compton, California. Actually, I was, I was the hospital, St. Francis Hospital in Linwood, but we were living in Compton. And uh, tell you what, buddy, you grew up fast in, in that part of Los Angeles in, in the 60s. Uh, no, no. You got consumed. Now, quite now, now, quite frankly, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Compton's you get you don't hear you get a whole lot of white folks living in Compton, uh, but back in the '60s, yeah. were there a lot more white people in Compton at the time? Yeah, you know, it was it was probably about a sixty forty deal, right? And uh, my mother had an aunt that lived there. She had a big, nice home in Compton, and and excuse me, my mother had a her sister, my aunt, and uh, we kind of settled next to her. And my dad was working. He was a Navy Navy uh, diver, and he he could weld underwater. So he worked at in down in San Pedro, and from Compton, that was just ten fifteen minutes away. So it was a good spot for us to live, and we lived right there on the boulevard, right right next to Compton College. And you know, as, when we got there as a when I was a young kid, it, it, it you know it, it was it was a nice place to live. And, and uh, as time went on, it it, it got more dominant in terms of. You know, a lot, a lot of, uh, I, I don't really don't know how to say this, but a lot of the white people were leaving town, and the neighborhood was becoming more of a black neighborhood. And you know, it 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 was a rough place to grow up. I mean, you know, you you wanted to live in Compton, California, you had to earn it. Let's put it that way. Well, how long were you there? Because you went to Bell High School, right? Because that's that's not Compton High School. How'd you end up over at Bell? My father, he invented the, you know, that electric hoist where they hoist cars up and work on the mufflers underneath. Yeah. Okay, well, my dad actually invented that and sold it for, I think, $2,000 to a couple guys, and, and then they became millionaires. And uh, he, my dad had actually built the first one because he was a welder, and he was getting in those pits. They, what they used to do is drive cars over a little pit in the ground, and you'd get in there and lay on your back and, and weld these mufflers and fix them and stuff like that. And he he kind of was he, he was a smart man and uh, pretty creative in, in, in those types of things. And he built his hoist and it just lifted it up and you could stand there and cut this thing off and work. And, and he didn't know what he had and he sold it and guys mass produced that and, you know, made millions of dollars in Los Angeles, you know, and all these muffler shops across the country now got them. So we were doing pretty well and, uh, he was making good money. We moved out to Anaheim and bought one of those little houses. You know, they had, uh, tore down, tore down one of those orange groves and built, built some real small, single family homes and, and then from there we migrated back to Bell and where I went to school at Bell High. Now dude, you've always been a big guy. Uh we were talking earlier and, and your mother was like four feet how many inches tall? <laughs> well my mom, God bless her Steve, thank you for bringing that up. She uh, she's the love of my life, I'll tell you what. She's four foot ten and just tougher than nails and She's uh, 87 year old today. She walks a half hour a day. She'll outlive me, that's for sure. But uh, where's she living now? She lives in Sonora, California. Okay. Up there, my sister and brother are up there, and it's a it's a little mountain town, just a couple hours uh, north of Sacramento, and they like it up there. It's about 3,500 3, feet, so they don't they don't get much snow, and 
it's a little bit cooler in the summers. You know, Sacramento gets pretty hot now, and uh, they're doing great. But anyway, she she's four foot ten, and the doctor grabbed my dad and said, "Hey, you know, we don't know what you got in there, but it's big, and you need to come out now." So at seven months and three weeks, I came out at ten pounds and uh, sixteen ounces and twenty three and a half inches long, and and uh, the, I guess the thinking on that was if they did not induce labor when they did that you know, it probably would have killed my mama, you know, giving me birth. I was just, just too big for her. Man, and a... my dad was a big guy. He was six four and my grandpa was six 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 and red headed guy, so you know, I got my size from my dad's side of the family, obviously. So there you know, you start growing up. Are you bigger than everybody in every single class you're in? Yeah, you know, for a long time there. I mean I I, I kinda of felt out of place. I, I was a little bit awkward socially. I was you know, fourth grade, I'm a foot taller than everybody and, and you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds every everybody. And, I, you know, I was overweight, but I wasn't fat. I was just, I was big. Right. My, I remember my dad was, he his thing was he used to cook breakfast on Sunday morning, Steve. And uh, that was his thing. And, boy, he could cook. He'd, you know, eggs and sausage and, and bacon and uh, pancakes and just anything you want, grits. And he, he that was his deal. And, you know, I polished off 10, 15 eggs and some pancakes, and I got up from that table, and I guess he took a look at my I stood up and turned my back and stretched my hands, and I was all about, what, seven or eight years old, and he looked at me and said, son, you got to do something, because you're just getting too big too fast, and so he, he, you know, he grabbed me by the wrist and took me down uh, to Pop Warner Football and signed me up. Thought, thought that the exercise was doing me good, and they said, "Well, how, you know, how old is your son?" And he said, "Well, he's, you know, I, and I don't really remember. I was seven or eight, and uh, they said, well, he'd have to play with the, you know, uh, either the nine and ten year olds and maybe the ten or eleven year olds." And, and let me tell you something, Steve. That's a big difference when you're that age. And, yeah, right. It is. Uh, I, I literally got the, the you know what beat out of me. I got on that scale, and they said, "You know what? He can play." He's 10 years old, but he's going to have to uh, lose, you know, 20 pounds to do that. So that's the ball career started and, uh, you know, kind of went on from there. Okay, so you go to high school and you're playing at Bell High School. You're all American. You're all Los Angeles. And you were saying, you were telling me that, hell, the all Los Angeles team was tougher to make than the all American team. Was the competition, the roster of talent coming from that area that deep? Well, Brad, let me tell you what, well, and, and, you know, Steve, I know you're from Texas, and I, I've had some heated conversations with people from Texas, and there, there's a lot of good football uh, states and, and, and cities, you know, Los Angeles, California. I mean, they, they put out a lot of good football players, and uh, Texas is certainly one of them. But uh, just for the record, you know, and, and, and I understand Los Angeles has a lot of people in it. They've got over, what, 800 high schools now, and back then it was five or 600 high schools. So uh, just in sheer numbers, you know, Los Angeles puts out more more high school All-Americans, more college All-Americans, more pros, more All-Pros, and more Hall of Fame football players than any other city in the country. So we played good football, and, uh, you know, competition breeds excellence, and we, I, I think we lost, we lost uh, two football games in four years of my career. So we were in the city... Uh, city championships every year and you know you could make all state you could make all american and you could uh, you could make all conference but the team to make the hardest team to make was that all los angeles team and i was fortunate enough to make that all los angeles team because like i said there's some good football players in los angeles and you know you you look on that roster that first team all los angeles team back in my era and you'll see guys go on to college and pros and and, and you know all pro and et cetera, et cetera. So you're at Bell High School, Leon. What position on the line are you playing? Well, I, I was an offensive and, and defensive tackle. I was a two-way starter at uh, Bell High, and uh, I love playing defense. I mean, I, that that was really my position, and probably just wasn't quite fast enough, you know. So is and, that why uh, that when you went to Colorado, that's why you stayed at offensive line? Yeah, in other words, I, I when I, when they recruited me, they recruited me. I I had a bunch of sacks in high school and a bunch of tackles, and kind of thought of an uh, offensive line lineman as being my second position. I could play it and I could do well at it, but uh, I you know just my love and my heart was uh, was was at that defensive spot, either the inside tackle or the outside tackle, and uh, you know I'd even shift back into a linebacker from time to time because you know on the high school level. 
you know, I could run with those guys. But, you know, you got into college and guys are faster and, and uh, they looked at me and said, well, you're, you're a center and a guard. And so I got to the University of Colorado and started out at guard and uh, started my freshman year and ended up being all conference and, and uh, all American at guard my junior year. And then I moved out to tackle, Steve, and, and we, we played both sides. So I started at all five offensive line positions. And uh, I was a preseason All-American at tackle going into my first senior year. And it was against Texas Tech, and I, I ruptured a, a cartilage, that, that medial meniscus. Uh, so I got redshirted, got my fifth year, moved into center, and uh, really kind of find my home. I love center. And it, it turned out, you know, the lateral movement I had, you know, snapped that ball and cut off that front side one technique. And then for those of people that don't understand that, is you got to play running to the right, and you're the center, and you got to – you got a man in that front side gap. In other words, you got to cut him off, and he's already he's already uh, two feet to the right of you, right where the play's going. And you got to get your body on the other side of him and cut him off. So when you talk about a, a center cutting off that front side technique, that one technique, that's hard to do. And uh, moved on to the Los Angeles Rams, and you know played for a few years, and was participated in that Super Bowl that the Rams played in, and. Uh, Never started as a professional football player. There was a gentleman by the name of Rich Saul, and he, he had that center position also. That he was a 16-, 17-year all-pro. And, boy, I'll tell you what, he was good. And being center in the NFL is, you know, it's, it's, it's about being big and strong, but it's more about experience and knowledge than anything. And this guy was, was uh, an all-pro and the best. And, you know, it wasn't about beating him out. It was about waiting until he got done and gave it right. up. And then. You know, and that's just, just that's just the bottom line, and, and that guy was that good. So I was in the preseason game, and I had played three quarters of that preseason game against the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, uh, you might remember this coming from Texas. You remember a guy named Randy White? He's a Hall of Famer. Man, I barely remember that guy. Yes, everybody in the world, and especially from Texas, <laughs> knows that, uh, Randy yeah, White. Randy so. White, when he was, you know, I was scared to death, and Randy was starting, and I, I you know, I, I said, Leon, here's your shot, and you wanted it, and and I said, well, you know, who's who's the Randy White? And I went, oh, my God. But I, I shut Randy White out for three quarters and no tackles, no sacks. And I shut him out. So how Rough was my... going to head-to-head with uh, with Randy White? He's Hall of Famer, what do you say? I mean, he had uh, he had the speed and the, and the strength. You know, he was a 500-plus plus pound bench presser back then and really had moved in from linebacker. So the thing the, the thing that I matched up well with Randy is I had quickness and I had strength to match his. And then Randy, being a linebacker, he didn't have the long arms. Right. And really for, like, if I was coming up today, I'd be a good football player and I might, might still get up into the NFL. But the NFL uh, offensive guards, uh, not necessarily the centers, but the offensive guards and the, and the tackle, Steve, they have longer arms, and these guys are recruited for this. And it's simple that the, the defensive linemen have longer arms. So if you're a, a big, strong offensive guard and you, your arms are four inches shorter than that guy across the line from you, just pure mathematics and, 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 and uh, sheer geometry is going to tell you he's going to get his hands on you first. And, boy, that's a big deal. And then when right. he's got his hands on you first and you can't, and you're just, you don't have a hold of him, you can't get a grasp on him, he's going to beat you. Right. So in today's NFL, I would definitely be a be a center today because it's more about positioning than it is, you know, having longer arms. So the thing that I, I matched up well with Randy is, our, you know, he was a linebacker converted to a defensive tackle, so his arms wasn't real long. And uh, got on a sweep, Steve, and then, uh, I cut back to catch a cornerback that was slicing in backside to, to get the tailback on a, on a sweep right, and I planted my right leg, and, boy, that, that patellar tendon just exploded. And uh, that was it, boy. I woke up and t- took the big hit from the cornerback because I, I planted that leg, and, boy, he stuck his helmet right under my jaw. And I woke up, and, I mean, I was I was out, and I kind of sat up, and I, I couldn't see my right leg. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, where, where did that go? And I looked, and it, it just made, at the knee joint, it made a 90-degree a, a turn, right turn. And, I, I mean, I, I couldn't see it. And I, was, I was looking at it. Oh, there it is. It's over to the side and to the back. That's not a good sign. So it, 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 we had a patellar tendon, both ligaments, both cartilages. And, you know, the Rams just, 
they put me in the hospital and fixed it all up. And, so there you are, Leon. You, you're uh, what are you weighing while you're playing football? I was uh, three fifteen. I, I was big for the era. I mean, most most guards and centers back then were in that you know two eighty. 275, 285, you okay, know, range. Okay, so you're 315. Well, what do you mention? You mentioned 600 at the time? I was probably, you know, 520, 525, maybe 530, you know, in that range. What kind of 40 then, times? Uh, well, I was, I was 485, 49. Um, that's I was pretty good. quick for a bit. And <laughs> that's, that's pretty that's, good 40. That's, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, for me, 315 pounds was light, so... You know, I had I had good legs and good strength, and, and you know what, Steve, I I couldn't run that uh, after that injury, but that's what my forty time coming out of college. I was I was uh, legitimate height, well six three and five eighths, and that was that was with an NFL measurement stick, and you know they they're pretty rough on that height. They don't give nothing. You right, know what I'm saying? Right. And uh, six three and five eighths, and I was like three hundred fifteen pounds, and. I did a single rep at that five, five and a quarter, and then uh, did that two and a quarter. I did it 54 times, and you know an NFL lineman today is doing it 35 or 40. So I was pretty strong, had a lot of endurance on that rep. But you just got to remember, we that the NFL back then wasn't doing blood testing for any kind of substances that might be in your body. So we we were able to take advantage of things that they're not necessarily able to take advantage of today. Right. You know what I'm saying. Oh, I hear, I hear what you're saying loud and clear. So you go from having all the, the materials, all the, the size, the speed, the strength to be a dominant offensive lineman in the NFL. You get your leg cut out, you blow out the patella tendon, the uh, Los Angeles Rams. Plan B is you go back to Bell and start selling real estate. Did you graduate from Colorado and get a business degree to do that? At the University of Colorado, I did graduate with a business degree. And, I, and, and when you said I went back to Bell, I, that was – uh, I believe I made a mistake in my notes. Um, no, I came back to Boulder when I I, uh, I stayed in L.A. I got a pretty good bonus, and I had bought a fourplex right there in uh, North Long Beach. It was about three uh, three blocks off the beach, and I was living in that that big three bedroom apartment on the ground floor, and then I had three two bedroom apartments in the back. So first thing I did was put that up for sale, and, and realized there was nothing for me in L.A. and, and uh, you know, I, I, growing up there, I, I had two sets of friends. I had friends that were Los Angeles Rams friends. And, and once you're not part of the team, I mean, they, it's kind of weird. It, you get hurt and they don't want you around because it's, it's kind of a bad omen. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, so I, I wasn't like I was going to be buddies with these guys. And then, then, you know, your buddies in high school that were, were still living in, in Bell. And that's, that is inner city LA. That's South Central, you know, Bell and, Southgate and Huntington Park and all that. So that was a whole different that was a whole different life for me, and I didn't want to get back into that environment. So the first thing I did is I, I ran back to Boulder, Colorado. And Boulder, Colorado, in, in that area, was a small little sleepy town, and you I know, mean, predominantly white and and uh, safe. Let me put it that way: safe for me because I, I was a type of individual that could could have gone either way at that point. Right. And you know, so I got my real estate degree and. Uh, went to class and passed that test, started selling real estate. And, well, man, and, so you're, uh, you're in your early absolutely. 20s right now, and, and uh, you spent a big part of your life in the business of professional wrestling, but you haven't mentioned it one time uh, really basically as a part of your growing up. Did you watch the business as a, as a kid? Were you a fan of, this, of the business back in the day, or was it purely I'm a football player and that's it? No, that's a good question. I, I I saw myself, be honest with you, as a football player. I was gonna, I was gonna play 15 years and and uh, you know make as much money as I could and pay off my house and you know have a family and, and then get into coaching, coaching football. Right. And I think that I really not missed my calling because that's that's my passion is coaching, and I'm good at it. I'm just flat out good at it. And someday I hope I get an opportunity to be in that be in that situation where I can can coach uh, young kids, whether it's football, uh, baseball, wrestling. Yeah, what, about, what about coaching some uh, pro wrestling? I mean, to me, uh, you know, watching your mannerisms in a ring, I was watching a lot of old footage of you. One of the things that I've always liked about you, just, just your mean streak, uh, just when you opened up on a guy, your demeanor, your body language, and, and guys, as simple as, as that may sound, 
it, it's a little more complex than, than it actually is because some people totally miss the boat on that. And, and did, did you always have that mean streak? And I'm not talking as a mean human being because everybody knows uh, you kind of knew you was a big teddy bear and you could certainly have your moments. But in the ring, uh, as, as I would probably assume on the football field, you had that killer instinct and the drive to just be dominant. And, and, and to me, in football and in wrestling, you must possess that. You know, I don't know, Steve. I, I, I've um, as as a football player and as a uh, a wrestler. Let's just take wrestling. When I when I walk into the arena, I I got into character. I mean, the minute I got out of that car and grabbed my bag, parked you know parked in the underground parking. Let's say we were at CN, CNN Center in Atlanta. We'd get there early, and uh, we'd we'd park that car underneath in that underground parking, and I'd grab my bag, and I'd walk into that arena, and I'd I'd get in character. I became Vader at that moment. And uh, there were two distinct, you know, individuals, I I guess, that that happened for me. And I started becoming Vader, you know, as I was lacing up my boots, as I was putting on the mask, and as I was going over my match, I didn't think it was Leon White anymore because, you know, as Leon White, I, I, I guess I am. I'm just a different person. I, I, don't, I don't really want to speculate on who I am or, or who I've become right. later on in life. But uh, and I, I guess I did the same thing uh, in football. And and I, I when I was a young kid growing up, I would go over to the high school and I would watch it and I would see the size and the strength of these guys and the, the aggressiveness and the coaches screaming and hollering and and that was just just instilled in me. And I guess growing up in Compton, California, I mean, and I, I'll tell you a quick story, you know, and this is, this is a little per- personal. And I also, also, I don't feel bad about sharing it. My, my father's passed away and he was a good man, but he, you know, he had his uh, problems with the alcohol. I mean, obviously there was, there was no drugs or no pills involved back then, but he was a big guy, six foot four, 270 pounds. And, you know, he lifted weights and he was, he was big, strong and powerful. And, he worked hard. He got up at four in the morning and welded all day. And uh, he'd come home and take a nap on the couch and get a shower. And he'd go up and he'd, he'd go out and have 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 a good time. And uh, one night he took uh, his my mother with him, and they were out, you know, at, at one of the local bars, you know, maybe two or three miles from the house. And uh, my sister and I were we're sitting there and we were watching, I remember this, we were watching that original series of Star Trek. <laughs> and you may be too young for this. Oh, no, no, dude, I was a big Star Trek fan. Go ahead. Man, uh, I was, I, I'm a huge, still am, still yeah. am a huge Star Trek fan, but I remember watching Captain Kirk on that black and white TV and <laughs> me and my sister were there and boy, three men, three men were coming through uh, the back window and one guy was already in the house and he was uh, pulling through the second guy he was standing on my bed pulling the second guy through. And uh, the third guy was pushing, you know, I could see the third guy out the window. And, uh, I mean, I just, I froze for an instant. He looked at me and I looked at him. And, boy, I'll tell you what, I, I screamed at my sister and I said, one. And, boy, uh, I went over there and grabbed her hand. She froze. And we ran out that front door, went down to the neighbors, called the cops. And, of course, they, they had left. And, uh it, it, you know, it was close. I had no idea what they would have done. I had no idea what they were doing in there. My, my dad had some guns in a gun case. He was, you know, he had some pistols and shotguns, and he'd take me hunting on the weekend. We'd drive out and shoot some rabbits and cook them and eat them. And I don't, I don't know what. I mean, we obviously didn't have nothing, so I don't know why they were in there. And I, I think it was, they were up to no good. My sister was a couple years older than me, and she was a pretty little thing. So I, 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 I it scares me to think about what would have happened. But uh, my buddy knew where my dad and my mom was and called up that, that you know, they were having a beer. And it, it, like I said, it, it's, it wasn't something that was out in the ordinary for us. But this next thing that happened, my dad came back and, and got a 20-gauge shotgun, gave me a box of shells and said, Leon, you know how to do it. Cops had left, and uh, he said, you know how to load this thing and you know how to use it. I've taught you. He says, if they come back, you know what to do. And he took a board uh, – boarding some nails and a hammer and real handyman and he boarded up that window and he went back out and finished drinking. And uh, so I was I was eight years old at the time, my sister was ten. And and that might tell you a little bit about, you know, the 
you know, my ability to turn it on and turn it off. Right. And at times, at times in my life, you know, I've had trouble turning it off. Get, you know, you got to be Vader for so long and so, uh, so meaningful. I mean, uh, sometimes I think I went overboard in the character and, uh, I guess it made me real believable. And, uh, you know, maybe I look back and think I might have might have got into that character too much. Might have worked a little too stiff. Uh, I'm sure I would have had the better success, especially in the WWE, had I been able to tone that character down and uh, work within the framework of of that particular company. And then I think that's important in professional wrestling. You have to, if you're a coach, you have to coach from a position of flexibility. And if you're a, a wrestler, you have to you have to wrestle within a, a a parameters of flexibility, but but Steve, yeah, just to answer your question, get back to you said you know were you always going to be a football player? My high school PE coach was an Italian dude, and he uh, he worked for a company down in uh, downtown Los Angeles, and every Friday night they had shows, and we would catch a bus, and he was his his, uh, his name was uh, Coach Ferragamo, about five foot nine and. You know, 240 pound Italian guy. And he worked under a mask, and we'd go down there, and we were mesmerized by it. So I was always a wrestling fan, but obviously, I got to—I got to be honest. My, my first love was football, and uh, that's what I pursued. But I was fascinated by the the whole thing about stepping outside of that curtain. And regardless if you're having a good day or a bad day in your life, it just goes away, and you become Vader, and you get in front of however many people are there, whether there's 200 or 20,000. And boy, it's just a feeling like none other. And I got addicted to it. And shoot, I've been doing it for 30 years now. So, 30 years in the business. I'm talking to Leon White from Boulder, Colorado on a Skype call. I hope the sound quality is good for everybody. It is what it is. Leon's over there. I'm over over here. But we got to do some audio whoop ass for you, the working man and the working woman. I'm going to come right back from a pause, take a break, listen to some words from my sponsors who keep us on the air for free twice a week. And Leon's going to talk about how he got started in the business of professional wrestling. One day working at a gym, someone said, hey, I got something you might be interested in. You're listening to another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Hey, man, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com. Get a quote and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. All right, everybody, uh, appreciate you guys uh, tuning in to Steve Austin Show. I'm talking to Leon White, Big Van Vader. When we left off, we got into a little bit of uh, Vader, but we got to get before Vader because before he was Vader, he started off in the AWA. Leon, okay, ex-football player. You watched the business a little bit. You dug it. So how do you end up uh, getting into business? You know what, buddy? I, after the Los Angeles Rams, I just got bored. I, I went back to Boulder and started, got my real estate license and started selling real estate and doing a little speculating and, and building a house here and selling the house. And I, I got bored out of my mind. I got tired of talking to women that wanted this color of curtain and this, this color of tile. And my goodness, I, I was about ready to, to, to have a fit. And I uh, went down to the local wrestling show down in Denver and they, they had a card on there. I mean, Bruiser Brody was on it, Stan Hansen, Jerry Blackwell, Kurt Henning, Big Scott Hall, uh, down in Denver, Colorado, at that old Denver Coliseum, and it held 8,800 8, people, and boy, it was jam-packed. And uh, that was exciting, i tell you what. And I put on a pair of cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, and I was, I had now ballooned up to, you know, 400-plus pounds, and I was in the gym, and Buddy, I, I could bench for 600 pounds. I could squat 1,000. And my <laughs> claim to fame, man, is I, I could take 365 pounds behind my neck and jump press that that weight uh, uh, 12, 15 times in, uh, in a rep. And uh, that used to stop the gym. I mean, I don't care where I was, if I was in Venice Beach, California, and some bus. That, that just everyone stopped and looked because there was no one in the gym that could do that, not yeah. that many reps. 
<laughs> that was just my thing. I don't know why I, I was good at it. I was good at that yeah. overhead press, and uh, they they said that's a big dude, and that's a lot of weight to be jerking over your head. So I I was bigger than a horse, man, and uh, had got gained a bunch of weight purposely for this meeting. I thought, hey, the bigger the better, right? And yeah. Because you're watching these guys on TV, and you're you know you're thinking they're all six eight and all four hundred pounds, and it uh, TV put size on people, and I walked in there and really saw the size of people and said, damn, I gained all this weight for nothing. So, <laughs> but, but I remember I did, I didn't knock on the door, Steve. And, the, you know, I just walked in and, uh, everybody just froze and, uh, a guy named Bruiser Brody stood up, walked over and, and I had my boots on and, and Brody, Brody was about six foot five. And, uh, he had his boots on. And so we were about eye to eye. He was a little taller than me, but I had a big boot on. So, he said, what the f*** do you want in my locker room? And uh, I said, I'm here to get a job. That's what I'm here for. And I stared him right back in the eye. And Brody, you know, Brody was just no one to mess with, period. And, and we all know that. And uh, may he rest in peace. But he turned out to be a pretty good friend of mine. And we uh, we, we had some places, matches together. But uh, Greg Gagne was there and a guy named Brad Riggins was there. And they come rushing over. And Kurt Henning, they came rushing over. And I said, hey, man, you can't be in here. And I said, wait a minute, man, this is who I am. And uh, you know, I live right down the road, and I, I played football at the University of Colorado, and I played for the Los Angeles Rams, and I had my Super Bowl ring on, and, you know, I was ready. Right. And uh, Gene Reed, the promoter, and then may he rest in peace, he said, yeah, I know who Leon is. We need to talk to this guy. And he calmed everyone down, so Grady hey, went and sat down. Hey, hey, let me jump in here real quick, Leon, because first of all, uh, uh, and to all my fans out there, I'm sure you can assume that the professional wrestling dressing room is super kayfabe. Now, if you go way back about 25 years or, or 30 years when Leon's talking about he first walks into this dressing room, you're talking about triple kayfabe. I mean, dude, you yeah. just walked in a, a badass area where the business was protected. And if you were just some unbeknownst fan just thinking you're going to walk in on a meeting or, or what the boys are doing, it's a good way to get your ass handed to you. So it was uh, absolutely crazy. So what what possessed you to even just get the idea to go in there and say, hey, I want a job? Well, like Steve, like I said, I was going crazy selling real estate. I, I, <laughs> you must have been. Out of my mind. And like I said, I got a pair of jeans on and a tight T-shirt. and I was 415 pounds. And I, I just said, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I stood by that door. I stood outside that door. For for an hour, probably at least an hour before I had the guts just to push it open or open it up and walk in. So what and happens? I, what are you thinking when Brody comes up to you face to face and you've only seen him as a fan sitting in a chair? He's in the ring doing his thing, and of course Brody's one of my favorite all time. And he had that look and that intimidating presence, that uh, the size. And again, you're a big man, but you're talking about Bruiser Brody, the guy you've been seeing on TV. So, I mean, when he comes walking up to you, what are you thinking? I, I, you know what? I got shit in my pants. Yeah. But uh, not straight up, I was scared to death, but I wasn't going to show it. Yep. And I stared him right down in the eye and said, man, I'm here to get a job. And, buddy, I was scared to death. I, my my knees were shaking, my hands were shaking, and I was, I was scared to death. Because, like I said, you watch wrestling on TV, especially back in those days, and, and – you know, you thought these guys were, weren't just tough. They were crazy and tough. And uh, so it, it took a lot of nerve to do that. But things calmed down real quick, Steve. And and, and Brad said, listen, he, let me get a pen and paper before before, before something happens. And <laughs> Brad Riggins just, he wrote down his name and number. He says, you're serious, call me. And uh, Greg Gagne says, well, we appreciate you coming in. And uh and Gene and Gene Reed had come over and shook my hand and said, No, no, this is Leon White. He he was you know, we had an appointment. I didn't think we'd meet in the locker room like this. And Gene was getting old, but Gene calmed everyone down and um next thing I know, man, I I'm I got my bags packed and uh, I'm in my car on my way to Minnesota. And uh you know, but Brad Riggins, what what a trainer, what a career he's had because he's put out some big, big names, you know. He's and trained- I, I can't name them all but yeah, I know he's, he's, he's trained a lot of great guys. So, but what was training camp like for you? Because you always hear the standard. Okay, we're going to do Hindu squats and push ups, or oh. it's all conditioning. What was Brad's methodology? I mean, was it learning how to take a bump? Brad obviously is known for his Olympic level wrestling. 
a great amateur background. So what was his protocol to teach uh, you who would go and become Big Van Vader? But right now you're still Leon White. Well, buddy, he, he, he broke us into groups, and, and, you know, there were some kids there that, you know, maybe didn't possess the athleticism, and he, he you know, he, he knew what he was doing. He was really good at what he did. And so we started off with a two-mile run, and at 415 pounds, that, you know, that was it for me. I, I finished that two-mile run, and, and it was like it was time for me to go back to the hotel, and, and in reality, it was just the beginning. Right. And then, right. then we got started for a three-hour workout, and, you know, we we started out with the basics and locking up and and Brad Brad uh, he liked to shoot with us. He you know he wanted to see what you were made of and he said, "Do you have any wrestling school skills?" And you know I said, "You know no." But I you know Brad is you know, if you look at him he's he's what five foot eight or nine and uh, you know you say, "Well heck I could handle this guy," but the bottom line is I mean this guy is is built like a fire hydrant, built like a coke machine and stronger. Back back in this this particular point in time, it, you know he was training for the 1980 uh, Olympics, and and then uh, Carter pulled the United States out of it, which which cost Brad millions of dollars and probably that gold medal because he was the odds-on favorite to win the gold. Right. And this guy wasn't just tough; he was super tough. He was five foot eight, five foot nine. He might not looked like Superman, you know, standing there in front of you. And uh, you know, here I am at six foot four legit, you know, according to that NFL tape and and uh, 400 plus pounds and Vince throwing all this weight around and I said, well, heck, I'm just going to, I just walked up and stood in front of him and he, he said, pair up. So I just walked over to him and thought, well, heck, I'll just throw him around and show him what's up. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's Joe Brad 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 Ring is what's <laughs> up. <laughs> keep, yeah. keep going, keep going. This is great. Well, Brad Riggins, he was, I mean, you you talk about a wrestling fanatic. He had a big, nice house, four or five bedroom home. And uh, he had a, a enclosed, because we're talking about Minnesota, enclosed pool, jacuzzi, everything. And, you know, he just, he filled it up with dirt and cement and just poured that, that pool over the cement so he could start his wrestling school. And uh, I always thought, what a shame to cover up that that beautiful pool and that beautiful jacuzzi. <laughs> but he did leave this little portable. It, it, it was a, in other words, it was a toilet. And what he had done is he had built a little square around the toilet, so that you know you didn't have to go in his house. His wrestlers didn't have to go in his house to use his restroom. Right. And, and boy, you know, we locked up and we started moving, and you know, I had good feet work, and I, I was kind of pass blocking him and really didn't know what I was doing. And uh, we got rougher and rougher and rougher and rougher and rougher. And the next thing I know, man, I am inside of this bathroom. He put my head, Steve, right through that door. I mean, knocked it off its hinges, cracked it. My head's bleeding. And I, my head, I'm on all fours, and my face is staring down in the toilet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He got, he got to the side of me, grabbed the back of my head, and just ran it right into that door. And... Well, I tell you what, you talk about an attitude adjustment, but I got up out of that. I got up, I got up and I was madder than hell. And I kicked that door and that door went flying. And I went over and got in line and said, "Yes, sir. What's next?" And buddy, <laughs> it, just, it just amazed me. I mean, this little guy just took me and and handled me like a rag doll. And that might I was be one the, of the greatest stories I've ever heard in my life. Yes, sir. But, what's next? And you was gonna go over there and show Brad Riggins what's up. That I, is I, unbelievable. And he just he manhandled me. I mean, I put up a pretty good tussle and and for about ten seconds, I yeah. think. And and buddy, he was just playing with me, getting getting his feet in position, got to the side of me and this I mean, just ran my head right through that door. I mean blood and and busted that door off off both its hinges cracked it and flipped it over and in other words the door's on my back and i'm on all fours and i'm staring in the toilet and, and the bad thing about it was the guy before me had not flushed the toilet so <laughs> <laughs> and you know what i was at the thousandth episode of raw and uh vince and hunter was good enough to bring me back for that and uh brock lesnar and i had never met the gentleman and, you know, Brock is a beast, and he had been Absolutely. trained by Brad Lincoln. And Brock was kind of looking at me, and I, I got up, and I went over and shook his hand and said, man, it's my honor to meet you. And we started talking about Brad. And 
And boy, I I brought up this story, and he just started laughing. He said, "Leon, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard." He said, "He said, well, you gotta give yourself credit. You tried." And I said, "Yeah, I didn't try very long, buddy." But uh, <laughs> hey, well, well, what what other kind of uh, were, were there any other uh, guys that were in the class with you that ended up making it in in the business or making it big time? Buddy, uh, you know, Rob Steiner was down there, and he had already went through a school, but he was. I think he was hanging on. He was hanging around Minnesota trying to get on with the AWA, so he was coming to the class, and you know he was kind of helping out uh, Brad. You know he was a student, but he was an experienced student. Now, what was and, your uh, what was your thoughts early on 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 uh, Steiner? Because man, that dude you talk about compact, dense, muscular, and super strong, and a good shooter. What was your impressions of Rick Steiner early on? Well, it was Rob, not Rick, and. Uh, well, I know it's Rob, guy. but but he would change his name to Rick because their name was Rob uh, Steiner, but it's Rick Steiner. So anyway, so Rob Steiner. Yeah. Well, you know, if you just think about that story I just told you, and Rob Rick was a he was a heck of a college wrestler too. He was an All American. He, yeah. he didn't go as far as Brad did. So I kind of had a had a newfound respect for for anybody that was a wrestler, whether it was high school, college, or, or especially the Olympics, and. Uh, he was a nice guy, and he he was very uh, helpful, very instructive. You know, we got along good, but it, it you know what? All the cockiness in me had, was gone, and I was there to learn and, and work hard. And but he, uh, you know, what a physical specimen! My God, back back in that day, just like you said, compact, strong, quick, just. I remember course, seeing quick, him. Just, I guess first yeah. time I started seeing uh, Rick Steiner. I think he was still going as as, as Rob Rick Steiner back then in Power Pro Mid South. I think was working for Bill Watts, and I saw this guy, and I was like, Jesus Christ, five five well, eleven yeah. maybe, and and maybe two fifty. But I mean, the most dense, two hundred and fifty pounds, and strong as hell. You could just see what he was doing on television, but just just totally impressive. So you guys are there at the school. How much training did Brad put you through before you got into your first match inside the squared circle? Well, you know what? A lot, a lot of what Brad did, he, you know, first thing he wanted to do is see if you if you had what it took, and it was it was all about the physicality. In other words, when when we wrestled, we shot. It was just just conditioning. You know, he'd do squats, he'd run you, he'd put you on the bike, we'd hit the ropes, we'd do push ups. if it was that type of thing, and if you got through, if you survived that. And then, then he started teaching wrestling, but he wasn't going to waste his time and teach everyone. But like you said, it was right. it wasn't just KFA back then; it was triple KFA. Right. So he wasn't going to give up the business till he thought you were going to make it. Right. And you know, you get a class of fifteen, twenty kids, and you know that would dwindle down to four or five pretty quick. And uh, you know, I'm sure sure Brad got his money up front, so it didn't matter. He 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 narrowed it down, and I made that cut, and I you know I wasn't going nowhere in the and then we started coaching, and he started coaching wrestling and psychology. And, and like I said, I, I can't say enough about Brad Riggins and his ability to coach. And, you know, I know Perth Henning was trained by him, Rick Rude, Scott Hall was there. You remember a guy named Berserker? He kind of had a gimmick like Brody. Yeah. Okay, he was down there. I mean, it just the list just goes on and on about who Brad Riggins has trained. You know, Brock Lesnar and on and on and on. But uh, I went over there, and I remember uh, – Brad said, you know, had told Vern Gagne. So Vern Gagne and Greg Gagne actually came over to the camp, and we put on a little show for him. I, I, I gave him a little five-minute match and was pressing people over my head and suplexing and moving and hitting the ropes. And, you know, they said, well, how much do you weigh? And I said, well, I'm about 420 now. I've lost some weight since I got here. And, uh, you know, doing a couple things off the top rope. And, and you know, so they, they, they were impressed and, and uh, you know, I remember Vern shaking Brad's hand, saying, "Good job, you know we can use this guy." And AWA was running strong, and they they had one heck of a talent roster, Steve. I mean, they had Michael Hayes and the Freebirds. They had uh, Sean Michaels, Sean and Michael. They had Kurt Henning, Scott Hall, Stan Hansen, Bruce Brody. I mean, that that list just kept going on and on of the talent that they had there to AWA at the time, and they were doing pretty good business. And that was back when we had the regional territories. Uh, you know, New York had their territory, and the AWA had their territory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, so I, you know, they were probably doing 20, 25 days a month, and I was getting about half of those and was happy to get it. But, 
Well, man, when you uh, mentioned those names, Leon, I mean, just as far as a couple of them, you you, you said a, a hell of a, a group of names there, a lot of Hall of Famers. But with the Road Warriors and then, you know, Bam Bam, uh, part of the Freebirds, Hanson and Brody there, man, that that's a, that's a hell of a damn roster. So who were you yeah, working yeah. with in your first uh, matches in the AWA? About a, yeah, the Kurt Hennings Hall of Famer, Scott yeah, Hall's Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stan Hansen and Bruiser Brody and Jerry Blackwell. Yeah. I mean, Jerry was, I mean, he was uh, five foot ten, you know, and big, big, big guy, but he was 400 and God, you know, nearly 500 pounds, and that guy could drop kick. So, I mean, that, that, that was a, for me, it was a great place to, to watch because there wasn't, once I got out of that camp, it was kind of like, you know, hey, this guy is not just strong. He's real strong and he's real dangerous because he's green and he wants to, to do well. So first thing they did was stick me with uh, Bruiser Brody. And, you know, it wasn't about, like, hey, I'm going to, you know, teach you some psychology. But Bruiser Brody just beat the hell out of me for three months. And uh, I was black and blue. And I said, you want a, you want a Bruiser Brody story? Yeah. Okay. We're, we're in Milwaukee. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of people. And, uh, Brody was barking around the ring, and I'm standing there looking stupid. And the referee standing, he's barking and doing circles. And he walks over and says, "Kid, kid, just just relax, stay right here. I'll be back." And we were in that Green Bay, Wisconsin indoor auditorium, and it, it must have held fifty thousand people. <laughs> Brody's barking around all the people, and then took off and went all the way to the top of that stadium and was doing bark, and somehow worked his way back down, got back in the ring walked over to me and I'm standing there like an idiot. The bell ain't been ring and uh, booted me in the mouth. And, and, and let me tell you what, it, it was not a working boot. I took, the, I took the hit on the back and uh, he had a chair in his hand and the chair obviously had Milwaukee chair company on that chair. Okay. And it was, it was engraved in that chair and he hit, he hit me in the back right in front of the referee because his intent was to get disqualified, and that was it. He didn't like something. He was upset about something because I remember Nick Bockwinkle was the was the booker, and uh, him and him and Nick had had, uh, had some words before the match. Maybe it's because he had to work with me, you know, because it just I was just greener than green. I don't know. But he booted me in the face. I went down. I got up. He took that chair and hit me in the back. Steve, I've never been hit so hard in my life, and I'm talking about throughout, you know, as a rookie with the Los Angeles Rams, you remember a guy named Hacksaw, Hacksaw yeah. Reynolds? Yeah. Okay. Well, Hacksaw was just a man. I mean, he was six foot two and 275 pounds, and boy, he he got right in front of me, and he came in on a blitz and a pass, and he hit me right under the chin and knocked me out cold. And I thought that I'll never get hit harder than that in my life. And Bruiser Brody hit me with that chair. And it literally knocked me out. I went down to my face, and I was laying there in the ring, and I couldn't move. I opened my eyes, and I, I, I actually took my fingers and to make sure they were open, and I still couldn't see. All I saw was black. <laughs> and I went into the locker room, and Kurt, Kurt Penning, who was, the, you know, just in my book, was one of the all-time great individuals, just funny, fun to be around. I drove yes. with him and Scott. Scott, Scott and I had, had developed a friendship back then and, and Kurt hitting and Scott came over and said, let me see your back. And he starts laughing. He's, and he got everyone around there. And on my back was imprinted the Milwaukee chair company. And, and he had hit me so hard that the lettering had, had made an impression on my back and you literally could read it. So <laughs> buddy, I'll tell you what, that I've never been hit harder than that in my life. And uh, so from, from Bruiser Brody, I went to Stan Hansen. And, you know, that wasn't much better. And then I finally got to Jerry Blackwell, and he he had a softer softer side to him. He was a big, tough guy, don't get me wrong, but, uh, you know, he started teaching me a little bit. And from there, I started learning, and, you know, my math just started improving. And uh, Well, let's go back and, to the uh, Bruiser Brody story when he, when he shellacked with the chair after the big boot to the gourd. Uh, usually okay. there's a little conversation that happens after the, uh, the goings-on in a match. Did uh did you did you say hey what's up or uh, shake hands or say are you just going about your business because uh, obviously you went out there thinking you was going to work a match and not so much. Well, no, he came up to me. He came up to me and stuck his hand out and then said, "Leon, that wasn't about you. 
I apologize. I hope you're all right. I mean, he wasn't apologetic, but he explained right, right. it that there's some things going on. And and you know what? I was in no position. I mean, again, this is this was Bruiser Brody. He was, you know, making big money over in Japan and really was doing this part time for Vern Gagne on his days off from Japan. But he had a full schedule with Baba, as did Stan. So Stan and, and Brody would come together and. Uh, you know, Stan Hansen in his prime and Bruiser Brody in his prime, let me tell you what, they're, they're, they were two mean cats. I mean, they, they could get in the ring and flag get the job done, and, and I can't say it without cussing, so I'm going to let it go. Go ahead. They could get it done. Oh, they could <laughs> fight or climb a tree, let me tell you what. Bruiser Brody in his prime, <laughs> six foot five, three 340 pounds, and uh, no fat on him, and, you know, he was in shape. You know, he, he didn't drink, he didn't, you know, and Stan the same way. Stan, Stan was... Uh, you know, wasn't quite as tall as Brody, but about 340. And let me tell you what, man, he, they, that, that was a tough job. You're listening to another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Support for this podcast comes from Pluto TV. Need an escape? Drop into Pluto TV for a world of free TV. Stream hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and shows all for free. Yeah, free. No subscriptions, no fees. Imagine 24-7 channels of Narcos, CSI, Star Trek, Survivor, and everything else from hit movies to binge-worthy TV shows, the latest news, live sports, comedy, and more. What are you waiting for? Download the free Pluto TV app for Android, iPhone, Roku, and Fire TV and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. Now, how was the early matches with Stan Hansen? Because in a little bit, we'll get to the, uh, some of your famous matches in Japan with Stan Hansen with the eye incident. But how was Stan Hansen early on? You're the green guy in the business. Here's Stan Hansen several years ahead of you, a veteran and a tough one uh, with a big name. So how were those matches with uh, Hansen uh, in the early days? You know, I've never had a, uh, a match quite like the, like the one I had with Brody, but you know what, Stan basically said, you know, his his attitude is so you want to be a wrestler. You know, you're a big football star and you're a big kid. And, you know, he heard all the stories about how much weight I was throwing around in the in the gym. And, you know, it's kind of like marking your territory. And he, boy, he did that. I mean, you know, I've taken that clothesline and just flipped me end over end, all 400 pounds of me. And I've taken his big boot. And it, it, was, it was kind of a process with me. I, I felt in my mind, that there was dues to be paid. And then, you know, you had to take take what they were given and keep your mouth shut and, and get back in the re- next next day to a degree and for a, a period of time. And that's, that's what happened with me. It's like, you know, I took it and took it. I felt I paid my dues. And then there came a time and a point where it, it just all of a sudden, yeah, you know what, I am 400 pounds and I can bench for 600. And you know what, I, I don't think you could do this if, if I don't let you do it. Right. In other words, there was, there was a, a definite respect. In other words, I paid my dues, I gave my respect, and I learned. And once I got to the point where I felt I was competent in the ring to have a match, then I started demanding to be given one. And if it didn't happen well, then you would uh, but you'd have to prove it. Yeah, yeah, but that but that's the process. Yeah, go and pay your dues. You're going to take some shellackings as part of that process. And, and along with that paying your dues comes the learning curve. And then all of a sudden... You start equaling things out, and it's like, okay, now here's what the story is. All due respect, yeah, I know who you're at, you are, but this is who I'm turning into right now. So, who came up with that? What were you? What did you start off with there, there, uh, Leon? Were you the baby bull then, or bull power? I, I started off actually in college as the baby bull. There was a, a a senior All American lineman at the University of Colorado. He just called me the baby bull, and then I, as I got to be a sophomore and a junior and a senior. It went from the baby bull to bull power, and then uh, my senior year, you know, uh, uh, they just called me the bull. And uh, so I, I naturally took that nickname from college football and thought, hey, the bull power, and I got some leather straps around my wrists and shaved my head and, and put, you know, I was going bald anyways up top, so I, you know, got those horns and, you know, kind of took that idea off the road warriors a little bit and just tried to come up with something. And, and so I was the uh, – Started out uh, in in the AWA as uh, the bull power, or just a bull. 
Okay, and, so uh, the Road Warriors are there. That when they when they saw you do the haircut gimmick, were they saying, "Hey, this is gimmick infringement," or were, or were they cool with what you were doing? They didn't say a word, buddy. I mean, that, you know, they they were, you know, the Road Warriors were number one tag team in the world for a long, long time. Yep. And uh, yep. they were making a ton of money, and, and you know, I always got along with Animal and Hawk, so they never said anything. And, and you know what, my hair was so light and. And, and Hawk was was pretty similar to mine, and then Joe's was different. But I, uh, I remember having a conversation with Hawk. I said, you know, with the way my hair is receding and 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 getting thin, I really don't have anything else to do other than shave it. And and uh, I tried that, and that that didn't look good. So I, I grew the horns back, and th- they were fine with it. They were, you know, again, they they were they were making a ton of money on the gimmick sales, their their merchandise, and they were they were getting paid a lot of money. And, you know, it just it didn't affect them, and it just wasn't a problem for them. You know. Did you see uh, uh, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty were there as the Rockers, Midnight Rockers? Did you see greatness on those uh, kids uh, at an early age, or did you just think there was a couple of uh, pain in the ass guys who were pretty athletic, and all the girls liked them? Well, you know what that 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 was the case. Uh, they were a pain in the ass, and they did have the girls. Let me tell you what, Shawn and Marty had the you know. They they had a, a following of little girls, just you know, little fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year old women, just go from town to town, and big crowds came. They they were talented though, and, and I'm you know specifically Sean. Uh, he had been in the business at that time less than a year, and you know he could have a he could have a great match in his sleep, and uh, he had the long hair back then, and. You know, he had the, the blonde hair, blue eyed, pretty boy and then buddy, let me tell you what, he could flat go. You know, that it was impressive to see Sean at that early age. You know, it was just it was just natural for him. Marty obviously was the you know, the second part of that tag team and was very good at himself. And, you know, he looked good and, and was tan and but I'll tell you what, uh, it was impressive to watch him. You know, and then again, that whole crew was Hall of Fame. Kurt Henning's in the Hall of Fame. Oh, I know. And, I, I know what you thought about Kurt. I know you struck up a friendship with Scott, and, and uh, he just got into the Hall of Fame. And, of course, I followed Scott from way back. Uh, and, man, a, a very, very talented guy. But what were your early impressions of the Freebirds? Michael Hayes was, was, to me, you know, he was the kind of the leader of that group. And, then, of course, you had Bam Bam, who was a big, talented man. Uh, the third part of that, that group, I, I forget his name, and I apologize. I'm sure uh, you'll know. Roberts. Yeah, okay. To me, they, you know what, of all the talent that was there, to me, the Freebirds was the best act on the show. I mean, from, and I'm talking about from the point, uh, and especially Michael Hayes, from the point of walking out the curtain and getting in that ring and, and, and putting on a show, and, and we're talking about tag team specialists. They always work six men. And man, I'll tell you what, I, I was I was a mark watching these guys work. And uh Bam Bam was what, he was he was right around three hundred pounds and yeah. Probably I don't know, six, three or four and and buddy he could move. He could flat get it and he'd hit those ropes and move and they they had their act down from Japan and Did you work south. with Gordy any over in Japan later on? No, I never hooked up with him. I was with the Noki and he was with Baba. Right. Him and uh, him and Doctor Death hooked up quite a bit. But uh, for the era, they were ahead of their time. Not only work in the ring, but the whole thing, the music, the hair, the look. And uh, everybody else was kind of a step behind. But, I mean, of all that talent there, uh, you know, and I'm, you know, you talk about Bruiser Brody and Stan. We, we've been through this list. I, I, thought, I thought the best of the best of that, that group in that era were the Freebirds. They, just, they had it all. When they came to Dallas, I was playing football at North Texas State University. I used to drive up to the Sportatorium and drink beer to watch the, the Von Ericks fight the Freebirds. And that damn Michael Hayes used to piss me off to no ends, which he was doing his job. And he's one of my favorites of all time. And he could talk trash all day long. And then they backed it up in the ring. And he was a heat sick and missile on the microphone. And then you had Big Gordy in there laying the heat down, and Buddy Roberts was that guy that everybody thought they could kick his ass if they just got their hands on him. And it was just pandemonium there in the sportatorium. So I was a big fan of the Freebirds. Surprise, they're not in the Hall of Fame yet. But Talking about the Hall of Fame, they've got the four horsemen in there, right? So they, yeah. they have the ability to put a group of people in, like a tag team. And uh, I know Michael 
is uh, Mr. Hayes is associated with the WWE. I believe he works for him. And uh, I don't know why that had happened because the, the fabulous Freebirds are, wow, they were ahead. They were 20 years ahead of their time and could flat entertain, put on a show. And, you know, but, but probably of the three, Bam Bam was probably the best worker. Yes. But it wasn't about individual work. It was about that team effort in the show. The bottom line was entertainment, and they flat got its job done. But I, I was really impressed with Michael and the look. And like you said, he could he could get it on on the mic. But you well, know, how, how was they, Vern to work for as a promoter? Well, my mom always told me if you don't got nothing good to say, then you probably shouldn't say it. But um, <laughs> you know, he, he paid good money. Yeah, and uh, you know if, if you were if you were on the show and he did well, you know I, I thought he was fair, especially to me just starting out. And, uh, uh, you know, Greg Gagne was actually running the show and, uh, Vern kind of took a back seat and, and then there was a, there was a gentleman by the name of, uh, Big Otto Vance that, uh, had actually had the world title. I mean, we're talking going back now, this, this was one generation of AWA talent. And then you went back to Andre and Hulk Hogan and that group with the AWA and then, they all migrated up up north, up to uh, Vince McMahon and the WWF at that time, and then he refilled it again with this new group. And and you know what I I, I haven't mentioned the Road Warriors; they were part of this group too. But uh, he turned me on to uh, Big Otto Vance, and I jumped at the chance. I mean, I looked at that roster and said, "Well, I believe in myself, and I believe I could crack that roster and become a main eventer there at KWA." But you know, I like the idea of going drinking some cold beer and getting over to Europe and starting out fresh and, and uh, getting another style under my belt. So I, I took that offer. Big, Big Auto made me an offer to come over there and offered me guaranteed money. And while I was gone and while I was over there in uh, Austria, and boy, it was beautiful, beautiful time in my life and, you know, had a lot of fun. So coming out of the, coming out of AWA, you'd been there roughly two years. And so you, you were coming along pretty good as, as a, uh, a hand in the ring. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And then you get to call Otto Vons wants you to come down there to the CWA, and you you say, "Hey, man, this is going to be a good move for you." Vern also felt this was a good good move for you to get, get a little bit more learning and get a little bit more experience. Well, the way it was put to me was, Leon, you know, hey, look at the talent we got in front of you, and we believe that you could become something special. But you know, there's a long list here, and. You know, again, you're talking about the road warriors, the fabulous free person, you know, just to be on that lineup. Yeah. To get on that card with something else. The road warriors, the free birds, you know, Jerry Blackwell, Stan Hansen, the Bruiser Brody, Kurt Hennings, well, Sean every, Michael. Everything Paul. you're mentioning is the main event match. So where were you on the card? You know, I was going to save this for a little bit later, but uh, myself and Scott Hall and Greg Gagne, you know, they, they were playing up the Ram thing, you know, a lot real big and, they would tag us up and I would get into the main event in that, in that aspect. And, uh, we, we fought, uh, Larry Sabisco and Masa Saito and, uh, another big Japanese kid. And, and that's how Masa Saito worked with me. And, and, and Masa had, uh, Ken Patera and himself had gotten into a little trouble. I don't want to get into it, right? but they spent a little time in the Husqvarna and, and, uh, they got out and, and Masa, you know, he was in, Tell you what, he was eating in prison because he came out of prison. He was about 300 pounds and muscled up. He was in that, that gym every day. And he, he's just, you know, Masa wasn't but about 5'9 and 300 pounds and was just he's thick. Solid, uh, solid as your wall you're, you're sitting next yeah. to. I mean, he was just rock hard. Scary looking dude. And uh, we got in there and, you know, he saw me move and, and lock up. And I grabbed him, snatched him over my head, and pressed him a couple times. and and this was really basically, I had wrestled him. I was working full time for Otto and had come back for Christmas and did a couple shots for, for Vern. And I happened to go to, uh, it was in Las Vegas and there was a TV match. And so Anoki Masa Saido was then, uh, working for Anoki and, and said, Hey, we got to get this guy. I mean, I guess they had tried to give, uh, the ultimate warrior, the Vader gimmick and offered him the helmet and offered him the, the spot. So you know, they had the they Vader know. gimmick already established. They were looking for the right person to put the Vader oh, gimmick yeah, on. No, no, and we're talking about I'm, Antonio I'm, Inoki and New Japan and Masa Saito is basically scouting you. Well, yes, sir. That's right. And and what they had done is they offered it to, to the warrior and then brought him over and got him in some matches. And the thing about uh, 
in my opinion, in all of wrestling, but specifically in Japan, Steve, athleticism plays a big part. These Japanese wrestlers are, are as good as any any wrestling any wrestlers are wrestling in the world, and and maybe better. A discipline standpoint, their, their matches are longer. They're they're entertaining. Their finishes are intricate and technicality. Uh, yes, but it's based on on uh, athleticism. And uh, the Ultimate Warrior, I mean, he was. He looked fantastic, but maybe it was a little bit awkward at times. It didn't have, you know, these, these Japanese guys are doing intricate moves and spots. And Man, so, going, going yeah. back to the day, let me jump in here, Leon. Going back to the day, and of course, uh, yes, Ultimate Warrior just went to the Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, just passed away. Uh, I used to uh, pay my money to go see him down there in Dallas, Texas as a Dingo Warrior. But that, that gimmick, with his work style, with his work rate, not so much. Well, yeah, not over there. Not, not over, over there. there. Yeah, these guys were all these guys. You you, you start with Inoki to uh, Choshu and Chono and Muta and Mizawa. These guys were were just good wrestlers. And, and and you're talking about you know they lived, eat, and breathed it. I mean they they had dojo set up and they had sleeping bags. They slept on the floor of the you know the ring was right ne- there and you'd have thirty guys sleeping around the ring. They'd wake up and fold up their sleeping bags and go to work. And hey, let's so talk about guys, that a little bit, that Leon. I mean, you know, the young boys down there, as, as we used to call them back in, I don't know if they still call them that, but, I mean, the guys coming through the camp, the guys that were training on their way up, you talk about paying some dues, mister. Now, and you paid your dues, and I certainly paid mine. And and the system changed a, a lot. But, man, those guys, uh, they, they start off at such a, a young age and are so regimented in their training and the repetition and shoot-style training. I mean, you, you can't help but be technically good and have a vast amount of respect for the business because, man, you're scrubbing floors to doing everything else to pay your dues to get your foot in the door. Yes, sir. Cleaning toilets and scrubbing floors, cooking dinner, going shopping, washing clothes. I mean, it, it, it's A to Z over there. Anyway, you know what? Uh, may, may, may the warrior rest in peace, and I, my prayers go out to his family, his, his wife, and two beautiful daughters. And, but it that gimmick just didn't work out for him. And so that, that match that I had at in Vegas with Masa when I was in Europe, uh, next thing I know, Noki had sent over a guy named Masao Hattori, who was a referee. And uh, yeah. he came over there and, you know, Otto, Otto welcomed him with open hands. And uh, I believe we were in Hanover and I was in a match. And next thing I know, you know, I got an offer from him to go, go over full time and work for Noki. And, you know, it wasn't just more money. It was substantially more money. And Big Otto, he, he got pretty mad and had a few words with Hot Tori and said, that, you know, I treated you like a gentleman, and you're you're over here trying to steal my, my top hand because I was, I was Otto's world champion at the time. And right. It, it was a hard situation for me because I love Big Otto and I loved Europe. But, you know, you're, I'm a young man and trying to buy a house for my, my family and feed my kid. And so it was a situation where, you know, I just couldn't say no. And, and uh so I was off to Japan. Yeah, but that's the way it is, Leon. I mean, you know, you're always looking to get to the to the, the, the next level. And for you, it was going to be New Japan, more money. And you had the three world titles that you got in the CWA with Otto Vance. And I watched a couple of y'all's matches. Y'all had some uh, bust-ass, brutal matches. How was it working with Big Otto? Hey, well, Big, Big Otto, you know what? He, he was slowing down a little bit at that time. Yeah. Um, he smoked a lot, and he drank a lot of beer. And I think the smoking hurt him more than anything, but... Uh, a big, strong, mobile guy, and uh, we had some good matches. And talk about a baby face. He was, he, he was just over like like Hulk Hogan in his prime, like you in your prime. When Steve Austin came through that curtain in the WWE, that crowd exploded. I'd never, Steve, I, I was standing right backstage one time, and you walked through the curtain. They played that music, and that glass broke, and bam! I mean, I got goosebumps. That crowd was so loud, and that's that's the type. You know, it, was, it wasn't a stone. Stone Cold Steve Austin pop, but let me tell you what, Big Auto was over in Europe, and it was the largest company in Europe. So we had crowds of fifteen and twenty and twenty-five thousand people in Bremen in that big auditorium, and and a lot of times they worked out of a tent, and I'm talking about a tent that would hold five thousand people. How was the lifestyle there? Because I mean, was there a lot of travel, or were y'all basically working the same tent shows night after night, and the people were coming to y'all, or did y'all take it out on the road? That's the other thing about it. You'd set up camp. Yeah. You talk about the differences and the, the, the experiences that I've, you know, from Japan to Mexico to Europe to America. 
and just to different lifestyles and cultures. I went over there and uh, Big Auto, he, he had bought me a little BMW and, uh, you know, riding on that Autobahn and that BMW going 150 miles an hour, that was, there was no speed limit on that Autobahn. That was a kick in the butt. Let me tell you, you're late for work, you could get there pretty quick, let me tell you. <laughs> You know the thing about the thing about Germany is slow drivers stay out of the left lane because it's the autobahn and, and that's the protocol. In the United States, people are so damn stupid they won't stay out of the left lane. They want to lollygag here because they got their head up their ass. In Germany, well, yeah. they know how to drive, or you will get your ass run off the road, buddy. And you know what? That last statement: if you're in that left lane and you're doing a you're doing 120, that ain't fast enough. Someone going 150 or 60 will run right into the back of you. Yep. They when they have a wreck over there, let me tell you, it's it's like a train wreck. To me, that was more fun. More that was a kick in the ass going to work every day in that little BMW and revving that thing up and getting going about 140, 150, and just like a kid in the candy store, I had a ball. But they wrestled rounds over there during this era, over in Europe, and uh, the referee was an integral part of the match where. They had four or five. They had three-minute rounds sometimes. They had four-minute rounds sometimes. They had five-minute rounds sometimes. So at the end of the first round, whatever it was, it didn't matter how long it was, but, you know, the referee would walk over to the, the announcer's table and act like he was doing something. The baby face would, of course, turn his back, and the heel me would, uh, you know, walk up and smack or kick or hit the baby face in the back. And then I would walk back to my corner. The referee would turn around because of crowd reaction. And I just put my hands up and go, well, hey, I didn't do anything. You didn't see nothing. And the baby face is complaining. So that goes on for a couple of times. And then uh, finally the baby face, you know, a similar situation will occur. You know, it's all set up. and The baby face would get you back. You know, you'd turn your back on the baby face and, <laughs> and he'd, uh, he'd come over and smack you. And But the ref would catch him, of course. Yeah. And boy, you know, some of these big matches. You know, I'd get away with it two or three times, and then the baby face get caught, and he'd get fined. He'd get a red card. And that red card referee would hold up that red card and then walk over to the announcer and say that the baby face, whomever it was, would be fined a 1,000 marks. And the, those are German Deutsch marks, and that's a lot of money. <laughs> and first thing you know, then these Germans would be all bearded up, and they'd stand up, and they'd have their girl with them, and, they, you know, Germans are proud people. And, boy, they would pay that fine. And so the the deal was, we were we were not only wrestling and entertaining, but we were working the cardiac, collecting <laughs> collecting money. <laughs> so you know we, we'd get some matches, some of those big matches against the top baby faces. You know I could set that thing up and, and you know with the referee and the baby face, and we'd get four or five thousand marks, uh, and they'd be paid for. You know of course the baby face would, you know, he'd look to the crowd and somebody would say, "I'll pay that fine." And we'd split that money after the match, but you know that that was good extra money back then. I I, I thought that was uh, I don't know. I I, I kind of liked the round thing. The, I, I like the fact that you guys were working within the work. So tell me about the round <laughs> system. I, I you know I watched a lot of uh, you know world of sports stuff, and I've talked to Steve Regal and some other guys who did the Otto Bunch, uh thing over in Germany. What did you like about the round system? Obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you, you get a good cardiovascular break because I would I would uh, love to have that break. But how did it play into uh, just from a strategic standpoint as far as psychology and working of the match? You know, you kind of didn't think of it as a break, and sometimes you know if you needed a break, you could take a break, and that was a big point. If you were doing you were doing seven eight rounds at five minutes, and uh, you get that minute, and you would you'd get to your corner and breathe, and you know get a little water and get a towel on your face. And then other times on the shorter two- and three-minute rounds, you know, you would do what we did and you'd get some money. But I kind of liked it. I think if it was introduced right here in America that, uh, you know, maybe one match per card, it, it might be something. It might be a good experiment to see how the people took it. Well, let me ask you this. Okay, now I'm thinking because we're fixing to start uh, graduating into the, the New Japan stuff when you really turned in to Vader. Because right now, you were still, uh, what, who were, who were you wrestling at for, uh, what was your name there uh, with Otto? The Bull or Bull Power. Okay, you're yeah, Bull or Bull Power. Now, had you graduated yet to that vicious, very stiff entering work style that you would be known uh, all around the world for in Japan yet? Yeah, you know, I, I, I you know, again, started out for me with Brad Riggins. And you know, we go back to that story where he put my head through that, that door. And then the way Brad Riggins taught was simply, 
hey, I'm going to see how tough you are before I start teaching you anything. And that goes back to what you said. It wasn't just k it was triple k Right. And then uh, then going to the AWA with, with uh, Bruiser Brody. And, you know, I just, you know, my first match was with Bruiser Brody. And well, you're basically now, fighting I'm, for your life. I mean, you're trying to show respect. But when you've got a guy like Brody and then graduating on to Hanson sawing on you at, early on in your career and you're, you're a big dude, but you've got to pay those respects. Uh, boy, if you ain't tough, and and obviously if if Brad Ringens uh, was weeding you out and you passed the weeding process, you were tough. God dang, that that's a hell of a quick one on one on here's how tough pro wrestling is. But you know what, you you, know, you have a way of putting things that gets right to the point, Steve. But then I went from uh, from Bruiser Brody, and then Stan Hansen, and just you know I got hit hit in the the Adam's apple with that big left clothesline so many times. I just thought that was the way it was. I mean, okay. Damn. Yeah. I just spent eight months of, of my life getting the living sh kicked out of me and this state is the way it is. Yeah. So the the first normal person I got in the ring with, and that was at the AWA, you know, and he got out of the ring and said, Leon, it, it was a pretty good match, but damn. He said, you know, you're a big, strong man. You, you're going to hurt somebody. And I, I said, buddy, I don't know what you're talking about. This, I've been getting the sh kicked out of me for the last year and I looked at him and I just I kind of said, thank you for the mask, but I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And so I, I kind of carried that on over there. And I guess because of the position that I was in being that, you know, I was, I was there probably two or three weeks and auto made me the world champion. And I didn't have the knowledge or experience to really carry the spot. It was because of my size and my ability to press people over my head and come off the top rope and do a moonsault and, and, you know, they just hadn't seen that out of a four and a pounder before. So, you know, he put me in that top spot right away. And what I had done is is there was two a referee that had been in the business 40, 50 years. His name was Jeff Jeffries and a guy named Mick McMichael. And they had both been in the business 40 or 50 years. And they had wrestled. They were two smaller individuals. So they had great referees. They had great knowledge of the business. I'd take that money and I would pay them to meet me in the, the arena or the tent, whatever it was, during the day, say around around two o'clock, I'd get up in the morning and eat breakfast and go to the gym for an hour, hour and a half, and then come and work with those guys for two hours. And they literally, they said, "Man, we're going to start over from scratch. I mean, we're going to teach you how to lock up, how to take it on, how to how to do this, and how to how to properly so you can get up to that top rope because you're just a big athletic guy, but you're not doing it right. There's a, there's a way to get up there." And they just basically retrain me not to bad riggings that did a bad job but basically they kind of put some fine touches and some finesse on right you know i I call it the accumulation of the little thing if i was doing 20 things wrong they would just take one one thing a day and fix it and i believe that happened a great deal well that god dang Uh, it shows a lot of gumption uh, uh, on your part to be smart enough to say hey man can you guys help me out and to go look for some extra help in an effort to speed up your process or round out your game or, or you know, to take your, your personal game higher. So when you're working these matches with Otto, now Otto was, like you said, he was smoking a little too much. He drank some, but he's a big dude, and he was over like Rover. So with your snug style, was he saying to you, hey, uh, Leon, hey, take it easy a little bit out here? Or was he no, game for whatever you brought? See, that's the difference. Uh, you know, the European style, the Japanese style, and especially the – and a Japanese style. It was just the opposite. And Otto was saying, the plan for my company is based around you being my world champion, and you know I'm going to create this monster out of you, and you have to show it in the ring. He said, I want you, I'm telling guys that, that I'm telling you to work stiff and to mm. become that monster. Wow. I mean, when you when you hit somebody, you know, hit them. And, and he said, do the same with me. I'll never forget you know, one of the matches I had with Cactus Jack, and he came up to me and said, Leon, I-, I want you to cut my face. I want you to break my nose. And this was kind of the attitude that I was given, you know, from Otto. He said, you know, you, these guys that uh, are working with you, I know you're going to lay them in, and we want you to lay them in, and we're going to create this, and we're going we're gonna to do some business. And uh, he said, you know, you can't put people in the hospital, but we want you to work stiff and we want you to work snug. And it, it, it was successful for me. And then, you know, then, of course, going over to Mexico, it was pretty much the same thing. Going over to Japan, I mean, my, I, I sat down in a room with Anoki and Masa Saido, and they said, listen, just go out there and be a monster. Do whatever you want to do, but get over. All right, you got Antonio Anoki, 
and Masa Sido sitting you down, telling you, hey, go out there and be a monster and get over. Y'all heard that. Yeah. They told Leon White to go out, be physical, and get over. And that's why I'm bringing today's show to a close. Doug, sit here and talk to Big Leon White for a hell of a long edition of this Steve Austin show. Thank you for joining us for another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show. Please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends. For more Steve Austin Show, go to podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Seven years ago, college wrestler Damian Hurd disappeared from a party in Gunnison, Colorado. Everyone has been drinking or whatever the usual party scene. When, how, and why he left are questions I need your help to understand. Nobody's heard from him. No, it's just like he disappeared. From Cold Case Productions and Podcast One, Final Days on Earth, The Life and Death of Damian Hurd. I'm your host, Claire Sanima. Join me April 20th for the season premiere. Yo, what's good? It's your boy, Big Brother Jake, a.k.a. Jake Warner. My government name. Check it out. I host a show called the Big Brother Jake Podcast, and I've taken my talents to the biggest and baddest platform on the planet. That's right, baby. Podcast One. My show is unique as I talk about everything. Life, sports, entertainment, being a single dad juggling several jobs. (laughs) I'm a hot mess, but it's damn entertaining. Subscribe and review now on Apple Podcasts and listen on Podcast One or wherever you get your podcasts.